Uh, good evening. Thank you, Titus. Uh, could you turn your Bibles to First um, John chapter four, verse seven, please? First John chapter four, verse seven. Uh, just as uh, announcements that we've been uh, putting out there for the last uh, week or so. Uh, our upcoming class schedule. There's some cancellations. Uh, next week, next week's classes are all canceled. Uh, Tuesday, April 24th. Wednesday, April 25th, and Thursday, April 26th. And then the week after that, Wednesday, May 2nd, there'll be no class, as well as Thursday, May 10th. So mark it on your calendar. Tuesday, April 24th, Wednesday, April 25th, Thursday, April 26th, Wednesday, May 2nd, and Thursday, May 10th. And uh, so we're going to also, as we ha- this is our custom on Thursdays, we have a, a corporate prayer meeting that our internet people can join us. We have the technology for that. So um, thanks to Titus. So... Uh, uh, everyone is invited, of course. So uh, our internet people can join us at that time. So let's uh, take a moment of silent prayers as our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer uh, to examine ourselves to see if we're in fellowship with God. The confession of sin, as we pointed out many times in the past in our study of First John 1, 9 in particular, uh, confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit. Remember that when we speak, uh, when we listen to the Word of God, uh, whether it's in our sanctified time alone with God or listening to our pastor, we're listening to as he accurately interprets the scriptures. We're hearing the Holy Spirit. So when we obey the Holy Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit. That's Ephesians 5.18. We're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And Colossians 3.16, to let the word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. If you look at both passages, they bear the same results, and well, they should, because 2 Peter 1.20 20 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit inspires the scriptures. He's the divine author of scripture. So if there's anything that's bothering you, troubling you, uh, do what First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that you're so graciously given to us. We thank you, Father, for uh, the good weather that's coming in, the good day today we had, and uh, we look forward to enjoying the good weather. We thank you, Father, for the rain and the snow and whatnot that we know that we need, and you're wiser than us, and of course, as the Creator. And we just thank you, Father, for the fact that uh, your Son holds everything together with the word of his power, and he sits at your right hand in control of human history. And we know that one day he will reign upon this earth and we will do so with him as the bride of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would help us light and live our lives in light of the imminency of the return of your son at the rapture to take us back to be with you and give us a resurrection body or our death, whichever comes first. So we might live a, help us live in light of the imminency of these two events so that we might uh, live a godly life and bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the things that you've been te- teaching us in the scriptures in our study of the rapture and also First John, and the other books and subjects that we've studied in the past. And we thank you, Father, for those of you people who are serious students of the Word of God that are um, uh, interested in these things and care about these things, the things of God. We thank you for the people that you've raised up in this ministry that have been faithful in attending services, whether face-to-face or uh, online. And um, we just thank you for each and every one of them. And we just thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home to us, making it possible so that we could meet four times a week and get your word out. We thank you, Father, for them. And thank you for Titus' work with the website and uh, the, uh, the sound of the recordings here this evening. We thank you for all that he does. And uh, we also um, thank you, Father, for all that Jody does as well. And uh, many things uh, people don't see. We just thank you for them. And we just uh, pray, Father that you would help Titus with the sound recordings here this evening, uh, help, them to, help them to do that with uh, Cheyenne. We thank you for her service back there as well, and all, many times she filled in and does things behind the scenes as well, serving you in the body of Christ. We just uh, pray that you give them wisdom in that area. Thank you for them, them, their service, and the technology people take advantage of the technology. We also pray that you would help me by the power of the Spirit to accurately interpret and communicate what First John 4, 7 is teaching so that your people might receive the necessary spiritual nourishment. We pray that you would speak to each person individually by the power of the Spirit and as a corporate unit, help people to learn, understand, and apply what they're being taught, and please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. Also, Father, I lift up 
Kelly's grandmother, and uh, we just pray, Father, that she, thank you for the fact that she's resting comfortably. And we pray, Father, you give the doctors and nurses wisdom her, with uh, her grandmother, and also comfort her and her family and her grandmother. And we also uh, lift up uh, Cheyenne. We know that she's uh, waiting to hear from the Air Force, so we pray that your will would be done concerning that, whatever that might be. And, uh, and, and we just thank you, Father, for uh, the opportunity that she has been given. So, Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at First John chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we just began this Tuesday the ninth major section of First John, which is contained in First John 4, 7 to First John 5, 3. Uh, so far, we've, we, we, we started our, uh, looking at verse 7, 1 John 4, 7, uh, uh, Tuesday. As, and, and just to back it up a bit, 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3 is about the love of God. Now, we've talked about the command to love one another several times. In fact, 1 John 3, 11 through 18, the centerpiece of the epistle, as indicated by the chiastic structure of 1 John, is all about that command. But uh, we're uh, going to have it more, more things developed here in 1 John 4, 7 to 1 John 5, 3. Now, on Tuesday, we noted the, uh, the first assertion that is found in 1 John 4, 7, namely that uh, the child of God must obey the command to love one another because this love originates with God. And then last evening, we noted that obedience to this command to love one another uh, manifest, uh, believe it, when he does that, manifest the fact that they are fathered by God, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and thus children of God. This evening we'll note that the, uh, the last assertion, and, uh, and where it says, and knows God in your Bibles, uh, that last assertion, we'll see, indicates that the child of God uh, knows God experience, experientially by obedience to the command to love one another. So, as we've seen many times, we've seen this concept of knowing God in First John, which actually is the verb ginosko. It means to know God experientially, which we've seen many times in the past, speaks of fellowship with God, but from a particular perspective. Namely, it's, he speaks of it as uh, fellowship with God, as being personally encountering God, the members of the Trinity, uh, and uh, through the process of learning and obeying God's word and, and, and being affected by that encounter, uh, namely, the character of, more the character of Christ and practical spiritual wisdom. So as we see, there's many metaphors for fellowship with God, and John uses several of them in 1 John. And so I've been trying to bring out these things uh, in our study, uh, uh, which is actually all about fellowship with God, which is maintained uh, by obedience to the command to love one another. And as we'll see in this study of 1 John 4, 7 through 1 John 5, 3, uh, loving, when, you love, when you obey that command to love one another as Christ has loved you, uh, you're manifesting the fact that you're loving God. Uh, you cannot love God. Uh, you cannot love God if you do not obey this command. So it's absolutely essential. It's a spiritual axiom that if you, you can only love God, the, each member of the Trinity, by obedience to this command. And if you don't obey this command, then you're not loving God. So this is very important that we understand these things, and we'll continue to develop these uh, as we go through this ninth major, ninth major section of First John. So let's read this uh, section, First John 4, 7. I'm reading from the Net Bible. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God has sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we reside in God and he in us and that he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God resides in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God is in us. God is love and the one who resides in love resides in God and God resides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. That's the Bema seat. Because just as Jesus is, so also are we in this world when we obey this command to love one another. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. 
The one who fears punishment has not been perfected in love. We love because he loved us first. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his fellow Christian, he's a liar. Because the one who does not love his fellow Christian, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And the commandment we have from him is this, that the one who loves God should love his fellow Christian too. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been fathered by God. And everyone who loves the father loves the child fathered by him. By this we know that we love the children of God whenever we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments do not weigh us down because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. Now, uh, there's a couple of things. We read that whole section because one, we want to, uh, we do this throughout our studies when we do a book and we've been doing this in First John. We do it all in all our studies. When we're studying a verse, we like to study it in its immediate context. That's why we read this section. We've already studied the immediate preceding context, but now we need to study the immediate uh, context, which is forward to it. So here's the other reason why I read this, and I read the scripture. This is, uh, when I, ministry I came from, they didn't do this enough. You got to read from scripture. In fact, we studied in, uh, in, in, in Paul, in, in the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And in the pastoral epistles, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was 1 Timothy, where to, Timothy was told as a pastor to publicly read scripture. And they did this in the early church all the time. Now, one of the things I do by doing this, not only to fill, fulfill that command, but this, you get familiar with the passage, get to know the passage. Like for instance, a lot of people have never studied Obadiah or Zephaniah. We've done those two Old Testament books. We, when, we, when I was doing, I did this by design, and I've mentioned it from time to time. Not only are we doing this reading scripture and studying a, a particular verse in its context, but also I want you to know what the passage, the book is saying. So as you go through 1 John, when we're done with it, you will know this book and you'll be f- familiar with it. Uh, in, the, in a good sense, not that you take it for adv- uh, gr- granted, but that you understand the, what's being said in this entire epistle. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And this is how you study the Bible. Like, I, when I study a book, I, you know, obviously I know I'm familiar with all the books, but when I study it, I read it over and over. And I'm not only doing that, I'm reading English translations, but I'm in the original text. And, I, and, and it's very important to get immersed in the text. That's why... I was talking to, um, there's a gentleman, he's an assistant pastor in some West Coast um, church, some, out, some church out in the West Coast in California, and uh, he is, uh, I, I met him through some kind of, uh, in Facebook, there's some kind of, you know, uh, New Testament nerdy, a nerdy language group or something like that, some bunch of nerdy guys that, into that stuff like myself. And we, they had people that ask, you know, so he had some question of some guy and I messaged him back because about, he was, had a question about Colossians and I did the whole book. And so, obviously, so we're ta- I, I, I sent him my stuff on the thing he asked about and he was like, oh, he's very thankful and stuff. And we were just going back and forth and I said, you know, I just, because we hadn't finished the book yet. I was like, I love this book, you know. And I was like, I'm afraid, well, I'm coming to the end of it. And I was like, he says, yeah. He says, I said, I think it's my favorite book. And he goes, yeah, I'm the same way. So when you, you read the book you're into, you're like, oh, it's the fav- your favorite book, you know. It's like, and then you get to it, you know. And then when you're, le- you're done with it, you're like, oh, you know, you, you're saying, like saying goodbye to a friend, you know. And then you go on to the next book and you fall in love with that book, you know. So it's kind of like a, a, a te- you know teenage boy who, who falls in love with a girl every, you know, oh, I love her, I fall in love with her, and the next day, he's, I fall in love with her, and stuff, you know, guys are like that uh, when they're young, and anyway, and when they're old. Anyways, but this is, uh, you know, you, you, I want you to get, fall in love with these books and, and get to know them. So there's a lot of things I'm doing when I'm teaching this. I might not exp- tell you this, but sometimes I like to explain it, because some people are, you know, but I, I remember one time I was reading in, uh, when I first came out to Iowa and I had somebody from the East Coast come out and visit me, and they were shocked, I mean, because they didn't, they, they didn't ever sit there and read a chapter of Romans. Like we were on, I was teaching on a passage, and I wasn't teaching Romans 6, I was actually, uh, actually before I taught that book, but I went to the passage because I was teaching something about sanctification, which is a big passage, position in Christ, and that Romans 6 is a big one, right? So I went to that along with Colossians 3 and others. And so I went to that, and I read the whole chapter, and like, he was like, really, why? You read the whole thing? He says, of course I'm going to read the whole thing. In fact, you're supposed to do that. You know, I told him the passages and stuff. You know, that, and, and so you wonder why a lot of Christians don't know their Bibles. It's probably because the pastors are doing a horrible job 
of teaching them the Bible, you know, and, you know, reading scripture, you know, we, the, you know, we, we should, we, it's nothing, it's good to memorize scripture too. I mean, I mean, I know some people say, oh no, well, you know, well, choose a translation you like and memorize scripture from it. I do it, you know, and, uh, that, I mean, it, you, cause you want the scripture in your head, you know, you want to be able to take it with you wherever you go. When you're at work, you know, you're in a different, difficult situation. You're trying to raise your family. You're dealing with a marriage problem. You're dealing with kids, problems with your kids, dealing with a problem at work. It's good to, you know, obviously God wants you to call upon these resources of his word that's in your head. So obviously we read these things a lot so we can get these things in our head. And nobody can get them in their head from just one cursory reading, you know, where we're just perusing it. Now you get it into your head by reading it over and over and over again. And if you don't think so, then you've, you've been, I don't know, you've been deceived by the devil, obviously, because the devil doesn't want you to read scripture daily. You should have a daily scripture reading every day. I do. I choose a translation. I read through. I got a program in Logos. You can, you can make up your own. And every day I read a couple of, two or three chapters every day. And I do a couple of times a year. A lot of times. But this year, I, do, I choose to do it one year for this. I'm, I'm in the ESV. I want to take my time looking through that translation. And so, I mean, that's because I want to know Scripture. I want to be able to call upon it. And, you know, the Holy Spirit can, can't, I mean, you're, you're basically put, tying the Holy Spirit's hands behind his back. I'm being, obviously, he doesn't hand, have hands. When you don't learn Scripture. What you, you know what I mean by that? Is, is he's speaking to us through the Scriptures that he's inspired, Right. Well, if you don't want to learn what he has to say in the scriptures, don't expect the Holy Spirit to be able to call something up for you when you're, when you're in a pinch. He can only do that for people who are actually listening to what he's saying. Yeah, he's indwelling you, but if you don't want to listen to what he has to say in the scripture, you're, ba- you're basically taking the Holy Spirit out of the picture, all the things that he can do for you and I when you do that. So learn what he's saying in the scripture. I'm trying to tell you this over and over again. Stop looking at Bible. Some people look at Bible study as an academic exercise. And that's not what this is about. I mean, there is academic in- discipline involved. But we're trying to listen to what the Spirit is saying. Why do you think I go back to the original language? Because I'm trying to tell you, it bring you it's close to the, what the, whole, the original audience heard the Spirit saying to them in, in, when, they, when they heard this letter written, not, uh, read. Now, this is the other thing. All of these read is, letters that we're reading in the New Testament, that we're studying, they were read in a public assembly. They were meant to be uh, the replacement for the person who wrote them. Like if Paul, John, they couldn't, they, they couldn't be at a certain location and they couldn't be at every one location at once. So they sent these letters out and they told them to copy them. We studied this in Colossians. You'll see it in First and Second Thessalonians. Let's pass them around, send them out, and they expect the apostles wanted them read publicly in the, in the public assembly. You, this is interesting. I tried to bring this out. The early church... They were, they, they were more, they, they were better listeners. We're a very visual, they're our, we're, they were an oral society. They listened to these things. We in the, church, in, the, in the 21st century, because of television and the internet, we're very, condu- we're very visual people. And that's kind of a, we're kind of a, that's a kind of a, not a good thing to be. Uh, we'd rather, I mean, the, 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 they used to listen to these things. And so, they were in replacement, these letters, for the personal presence of the writer, the apostles, like John. And so they were their sermons. So that's why I say, you want to learn how to write a sermon? But if you'll notice, they're not like the sermons that we hear today in many churches today. They were teaching in these letters and addressing specific problems. They were teachers. They were not, they were not flowery messages. Romans is not a, although it rhetoric, rhetorically back in that day, this, it was a masterpiece. And this is a masterpiece that we're studying and when they heard it, it was it, they, these guys didn't write these letters, uh, you know. It, like John sat down and he wrote these, you know, uh, Paul, and they wrote these down these letters like we do write a letter today or write an email. No, this they took their time doing these things, and they had uh, they, they 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 had a group that was they were with, and they would talk about these things. Of course, the apostle like John or Paul or Peter, they were the boss. But these, they took their time writing these things. In fact, it took days to write Romans. And it probably took day, a couple of days to do First John. And uh, so these, it, it, these, these letters were very, this is the way they taught the church. And they were very important to the church because the apostles couldn't be in more than only in one location. They could only be in one location at once, so obviously. So they used these letters to, so that they could have their presence everywhere. And the Spirit inspired them to write these letters. And these letters are very, very, we're listening to the Holy Spirit 
as, if I'm communicating it accurately, you're listening to the Holy Spirit speaking. And he's speaking now because he's trying to give you understanding about these books and trying to help you understand the scripture. And so that's what I'm trying to do for you. So we're, we're on 1 John 4, 7 with that introduction out of the way. We're going to finish off 1 John 4, 7 here this evening. The ESV translates 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, let me interject this kind of connected to what I just said. Uh, you notice that you might be asking yourself, those who are listening on the internet, or maybe right in front of me. If you notice, I read from the Net Bible in class, but when I go to do, you know, go to verse by verse, and I go and look at a specific passage, I switch over to the ESV. Why do I do that? Well, I, I like the ESV because it's a good study Bible, because it's a, because of its approach to translation, and so it makes it easier for me to go through the text because they're, a lot of times they try to do word for word correspondence, and the Net Bible is pretty good with that too, but. Uh, I like to do the, uh, the ESV. I, my, eventually, if I had a, a, an interlinear that had the Net Bible, you might that keep that prayer for me, I would just use the Net Bible all the time if I had my druthers. But because they don't have an inter, interlinear, it, it saves me time to match up each word with each, you know, in the translation. I suppose I could do it myself, obviously. But I just go use the ESV. Why not? It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with reading more than one translation in, in Bible class. Nothing wrong with that at all, actually. I don't know, what, and I and I'm not the only one that thinks that. The many scholars would tell you that's a good idea because why not take advantage of all the scholarship that you have in these great English translations that we have? So we're going to look at the final assertion and knows God, and that's a result clause because the word and is translating the conjunction chi. It's correct to tra- translate the word that way, but uh, it's not only used as a connective, but if you compare what it's saying, introducing, knows God, with what it just said, whoever loves has been born of God, uh, it's presenting the result. This phrase, knows God, is, a, is presenting the result of the second assertion. So this word, and, conjunction chi, and knows God, is functioning as a marker of result. It did that in the previous assertion, and whoever loves has been born of God. And we translated the and there Consequently, here, uh, if the word and, and knows God, is a marker of result, which means that this phrase, uh, knows God, is a declarative statement which presents the result of the previous result clause, which asserts that the person who does it any time divinely loves has been fathered by God. Now, I'm not going to translate it with the English word consequently here, because we already used that English word. So for variety, I use the phrase, and the, with the result, something like that, you can use. Uh, some kind of English word or phrase that is also means uh, present, expresses result. Now, the word knows, as I pointed out earlier, we've seen it quite a bit in John's writing. Uh, when you see the word knows, K-N-O-W, and you, you see that ver- English word in First John, it can mean to know experientially. It can also mean to confirm. We've seen that in the past. The context determines its meaning. And uh, that's true of any word in any language we're talking about. So knows here, it means to know experientially in this context. And to experience, what does that mean? It, because it helps us understand what this Greek word is saying. It means to personally encounter observe or undergo something through a process to have knowledge or practical wisdom gained from what one has observed, encountered, or undergone. And it implies being affected by what one meets. So here, uh, uh, that's what is involved here with this word ginosko. The word God there, it's a reference to the Father. That's indicated by the word's articular construction, which is anaphoric. And as we, if you, you, should, you probably remember that now because I use it a lot. And you don't have to remember it. But I would, because it's uh, pointing back to the previous use of the word in the verse. And it says that this word is retaining its same referent and meaning. The referent means the person it's referring to. Okay, so think of the word referent, reference, same thing. So who do, when the word God was used in the previous assertion, it was speaking of the Father, as we pointed out. And we gave our reasons why it wasn't when we studied that second assertion. So therefore, if you put the word God, get theos, where this word Ginosko knows, it, which means to know experientially. This, uh, these two words are expressing the concept of knowing the Father experientially in the sense of personally encountering him through the process of learning and obeying his will and as this will is revealed in the pages of Scripture and in prayer by God the Holy Spirit. It also 
involves being affected by this encounter with the Father, resulting in the gaining of practical spiritual wisdom and more of the character of Christ. Now, this word, ginosko, it's in the present tense. It's what we call a gnomic present, which we've seen quite a bit in John. And here it's used for a general timeless fact, or specifically a spiritual axiom or an eternal spiritual truth. It's used to express an absolute statement that's true all the time. Now, this is good for, for those who are... Um, graduate students or people who might be pastors that listen in, because there are, or people who are an associate pastor or something like that, and that they come in and listen. I know they contact me from time to time. Don't be faked out by a present, you know, sometimes people would think of a present tense when they look study Greek for the first time, and they think, oh, it's talking about some kind of dirt of action, habitual activity. Many times it does. Sometimes it talks about repeated activity. But sometimes it doesn't have that idea at all, uh, especially... Uh, when a principle is being taught. Sometimes it speaks of something that does take place rather than how often it takes place. Okay? And sometimes it talks about an eternal spiritual principle. We see this type of gnomic present uh, with, with God as the subject. God is light. That's an axiom. It's true all the time. God is spirit. We've seen that in John's gospel. It's an axiom. It doesn't change. It's always that way. So you've got to be careful of the present tense when you study and the original language and uh, you'll learn this as you stay in and study and, and learn from people who are scholars and Greek, good Greek grammars. For those who are actually looking at the original language, I would highly recommend, um, and it, as an intermediate grammar for sure, uh, Wallace's Greek grammar, it's in all, every, all the seminaries use it. And, but that's an intermediate grammar, but I'd still pick it up anyways, even just for a beginner to learn Greek grammar because I know I did. When I, 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 I didn't know a lot about Greek grammar. I was reading A.T. A, a, a. Robinson's thing, and it was like 1,200 pages. I was working off of that, and Dana Mianti, but Wallace's came along. I was like, oh, thank God. It was like, it's brilliant. It's still brilliant. Wallace's, Dan Wallace did a great job, Dr. Dan Wallace, and um, I'd like to meet him sometime. Anyways, uh, somebody asked me, what, what's the most, uh, inf- one of the most influential books that you have? Some guy, he's a pastor, Don, and I don't know where he's, California and this other guy. Everybody comes from California. And he goes, so what is your, name me, give me some books that you would say are your books that you most influenced by. I said, well, one of them is Dan Wallace's Greek grammar of the New Testament. I was like, that book helped me immensely understanding the original language. So that, if you want to talk about a book that was influential, that grammar. And, and in Hebrew, uh, Williams's grammar. I think that's... Uh, very underrated. I know Walkie and all those guys, I got that too, but I like Williams for the Old Testament. So anyways, the present tense is, uh, and I say that in a, I, I mentioned, I'm throwing these things in because we have a very eclectic audience I've learned over the years, so my, uh, I'm not going to apologize, but I'm going to say you got to be patient with me because I'm speaking to different people at different levels. Some people are just lay people who don't have any don't really care about the original language or, or Greek grammar or anything, or Hebrew grammar. But there's some that do, and they listen in. And I know there's some people that, that obviously, you know, they, they're trying to understand the passage, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do all these things, try to reach some people. So be, so what you need to do is be patient with me, as I've mentioned in the past, as I do that. And I would appreciate you if you did. And uh, and for those people who are, you know, further along, and, you know, they, they, you know, they, they look at studying the original language and you're like, you know, they're, you, you know your stuff. Uh, be patient while I talk to somebody about something that might be uh, a basic doctrine for you. Uh, uh, but somebody else in, my, in the audience might need that. There might be a teenager in my audience that you don't know about or, or somebody who is just a, first a new believer. You don't know who's in the audience. And I always try to, you know, follow the Holy Spirit's guide and direction. I, I'm able to do these things to minister to all these people. And uh, hopefully I do that in general and habitually and I don't my apologies I pray for me and I, that I get better at doing that so the, the present tense here it's expressing the idea the word knows there is uh, expressing the idea that the person who at any time does divinely love does as an eternal spiritual too know the father experientially so the nomic present here knows uh, it's speaking of something that's an axiom it's true all the time so he's you know so it We'll see it. We'll read my translation. Everything's connected in this verse, and it's teaching us something, all three assertions. So the present tense of this verb is also a customary present uh, uh, used to express a state here, an ongoing state, and it expresses the idea that the person who at any time does divinely love, does as an eternal spiritual truth, exist in the state of knowing the Father experientially. So if we love God, it's an axiom spiritually. It never changes. It's true all the time. 
you're going to know God experientially. In other words, you're going to have fellowship with him. So if you could, look at my, first John, uh, look at my translation of 1 John 4, 7, please. 1 John 4, 7. And for those internet people who are coming in for the first time, you want to read from our translation with us, go to our website, and uh, the written library, and 1 John 2017, and there's an updated translation there. Uh, translation of First John there. There's an expanded translation. You don't want that one. You can download it if you like. But we're going to read from the other one because the expanded translation is too wordy to read in class. So I try to pay attention. I didn't always do this, but I'm, trying, I'm learning uh, to pay attention to readability in class. So sometimes I, I, I hit a home run. Sometimes I don't. Look at First John 4. Hopefully, I, and the, the key thing is that I get better. So keep that in prayer for me. First John 4, 7. Beloved, let each one of us continue to divinely love one another. Because this love is a characteristic originating from God. In context, as we know, it's the Father. And this is true of the Son and the Spirit, too, but he's talking to the Father. Consequently, the one who at any time does divinely love has been fathered by God. That, again, is the Father. As a result, they know God, the Father, experientially. So 1 John 4, 7 ends with a result clause, as we pointed out, which presents the result of the child of God practicing the love of God in relation to their fellow child of God, and it asserts that they know God the Father experientially. So therefore, people, John is teaching the recipients of 1 John, and us by the power of the Spirit in the 21st century, that knowing God the Father experientially, fellowshipping with him, is the direct result of the child of God practicing the love of God in their life. In other words, he's teaching that obedience to the command to love one another is the means by which the child of God, you and I, experiences fellowship with the Trinity. If we're experiencing fellowship with the Father, we're experiencing fellowship with the Son and the Spirit as well. When John speaks of knowing the Father experientially, he's referring to the child of God experiencing fellowship from a particular perspective, which we pointed out is the, that they are personally encountering the Father by obedience to his will as this will is revealed in the pages of Scripture and in prayer by God the Holy Spirit. And this also involves being affected by this encounter with the Father, resulting in the gaining of practical spiritual wisdom and more of the character of Christ. So uh, I want to throw this in. I noticed in my, my t- definition uh, of uh, that fellowship, uh, knowing God, ex- the Father experientially, and thus knowing the other two members of the, the Trinity experientially, it speaks of experiencing fellowship with God from the perspective that you and I are personally encountering the Father by obedience to his will, as this will is revealed in the pages of Scripture and in prayer by the Holy Spirit. So this is another thing. When we go and study the Bible, I do this all the time. I pray. I'm talking to God before I pray. I ask him to help me all the time. Anytime I sit down, I never, ever always make sure, because I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Help me understand the passage. While I'm studying it, and while I'm after it, and while I'm teaching it, I many times, I, we talked about biblical meditation, thinking about, talking it out. See, great thing about being alone, nobody hears what I'm saying. I talk to myself all the time, and a lot of times it's talking to God, and reasoning these things out, and how it applies to me, how I can teach it, how it applies to my people, and the body of Christ, and understanding it. And so I, 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 I pray on these things. Prayer is an ongoing conversation with God, not just when you sit down. I talk to God throughout the day and have done that for years. Uh, before I became a pastor, when I was in a job and different jobs and different things, I always was talking to God. I might not have audibly heard me, but I do that all the time. And, you, and I say prayer. We need to be in prayer too to understand what our Bibles are saying. So many times, we, maybe, maybe we're not understanding everything because we're not taking the time to sit down to be alone with God and prayer. So uh, whatever time you can set aside and you need to make that a priority, priority. and uh, there are other things we can cut out if you take an inventory of our lives. And I've talked about this before. That look at the things. I've had to do this. Uh, look at the things that are not a priority. What are the things that are a priority? And then if they bump into other things, the things that get the priority, the things of God, they get the priority. So let me give you an example. Um, I like, uh, I, don't, I don't turn on a television set until I am done here. Like tonight, I will finish, go home, and by the time I stop and do everything I've done, I need to do, finishes my day after teaching, it'll probably be about uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock. Okay, sometimes it might run a little bit later. 
And so I'm done, and then I'm going to go cook dinner. Okay, that's by the time I get the chance to eat dinner. I am. I. I will. Not, I, I don't watch television anytime in, until after that. When I sit down at dinner, I might sit down and watch, you know, a show I like, you know, on Amazon or something, or I'll watch, you know, some kind of thing a uh, guy teaching, or I'll watch uh, an old Muhammad Ali or Rocky Marciano fight on on YouTube. But I can't. I, I you know, I don't watch any sports. I hardly ever watch any sports because I don't have the time. A lot of times, because that's not a priority for me. Uh, I, there's a lot of times I, you know, play guitar. I don't play as much as I used to. I used to play seven hours a day. I don't do that anymore. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. That's not a priority for me anymore. I do play uh, because I use it in the ministry too. But and I like to do, it, and it's a great blessing that God's given me. But that's not a priority for me to play seven hours a day. So what I'm telling you is, there's certain things that I lo- love to do, but they're not going to get priority over learning and understanding and praying. And, and applying God's word in my life and trying to understand what God's saying. So I spend time alone with God because that's a priority. And I, and I know, you know, that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, you know, when you're married, you know, I get an advantage over married people. I do. I just, I'm, not, I'm just telling you that's what Paul says because 1 Corinthians 7, 7, he says, you know, a single person, they're occupied with the things of the Lord. Not that the married people can't be, but the married people have to take care of their spouses and their kids. That's a priority. God wants them to take care of that. That's why Paul said, I'd rather you be like me, single, because, you know, but not everybody is able to do that. So you get married and have kids. There's just there's nothing wrong with that. You're not sinning, he says. First Corinthians 7. But I get, you get an advantage. Like Jim, you know, Jim and I will have a, you know, he'll, when he tries to comfort me, you know, I'm going, you know, I might be, you know, bothered about something and, I, you know, I use him as a springboard. He does the same with me. He calls me up when he, when he wants to, uh, you know, complain about his wife. No, I'm just kidding. Death listens to that. You kill me. But no, he never, he never ever says that. But he was like, he was like, you know, we'll we'll bounce off each other stuff because we we're both going through this. We have the same kind of uh, calling, and 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 so we, we there's only things that he a pastor could understand what I'm talking about, and vice versa with him. So, anyways, uh, he'll say to comfort me sometimes, like, hey, when I'm when I'm out working on the house or I'm doing something with my kids and everything, or you know, I'm making love to my wife. You're studying in front like it. That's right. That's true. That's true. Thank you for the encouragement. So I said, uh, and uh, I'll remember you when I'm in, in, in and I'm just, I'm not going to be funny. But yeah, he, he comforts me that way because I, you get, I have an advantage. I mean, I, I don't know what I would do. If I, was, if I was married, boy, they'd have to really be something else to be because I, I'm like, like, I don't know what I would do now if my life was changed where I had to be married to somebody. And, she, you know, sure, then I was like, you know, because I like walking around the house talking to myself, <laughs> talking to God, <laughs> you know. I mean, I just, it's great being, it'll come and go as you please. Not that I go run around town. But, you know, I, but when you're married, you have to, you know, there's advantages of being married, being, being, being single. Grass is always green on the other side. If you're single, be happy that you're single. If you're married, be happy you're married. Don't complain about it. Just accept God. You can serve God wherever you are. Now, how did I get into that? Oh, be alone with God in prayer. You know, marriage is a, it, it's very hard. Married people have a really tough uh, situation because they got to balance all these things, especially if you have young kids and teenagers. If there's a lot of pressure. Then you got your own jobs you're dealing with. I understand all that. So I pray. That's why I pray for you guys. And you got to find some way to fit these things in. What Even if it's... 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, and try to get it. I, I know before I would go to work in the morning, before I was a pastor, I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I would, so I could have time to be in the Word before I went to work. And uh, I did that for years, and, and, pray, and so I could pray too. Because I, I didn't ever want to go to work before I if I, I, I don't want to get out the door before, unless I've t- listened to God in, in the Word and prayed to Him. I, you know, my day went went much better. Not that I didn't have problems, but it was easy to deal with the day when I was got to I got loaded up by God with His Word, you know, and with the you know, and getting strengthened with His power from His Word. And again, you got to personally. We want to personally encounter God. That's what John's talking about here. You will obey the command to love one another, and all that involves praying for them, your fellow believer, being uh, tend, kind and tender-hearted, being patient and tolerant with them. You know, we, t- we, t- we tick pe- each other off. We're all sinners. I'm sure I tick people in the, t- I know the Thompsons, but they must be like spiritual giants being around me after all these years. And, you know, 
putting up with whatever, you know, my personality, and I know my personality is not exactly, everybody loves it, you know, I, but they have to be patient and tolerant of me, you know, they got to, you know, you know, that's Bill, you know, and, and they, I, I appreciate that. And so we got to do that because that's love. And we're doing that with, we're fellowshipping with God. We're personally coming in contact with God. So therefore, in 1 John 4, 7, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John is teaching the recipients of 1 John that they're obligated to continue to obey the command to love one another because this love originates with the character and nature of their Heavenly Father. In other words, they must be characterized by this love because this love characterizes their Heavenly Father. Thus, they will be characterized by this love by their continued obedience to this command to love one another. John is also teaching that obedience to this command demonstrates that they're children of God. And lastly, as we've seen this evening, he's teaching that obedience to this command results in personally encountering the Father, which results in practical spiritual wisdom and more the character of his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. So this personal encounter with the Father is referring to experiencing fellowship with God. And this is not the first time in 1 John that the Apostle John speaks of knowing the Father experientially because he mentions it in 1 John 2.14. If you could, hold your place. Go to my translation of 1 John 2.14, please. 1 John 2.14. 1 John 2.14, and, and remember when we, when we studied this, 1 John 2.12-14 is essential to understanding the status spiritually of the people who he's writing to. Very important. We, I try to bring this out whenever book I'm studying. You can, like the epistles of Paul, like Colossians we did, or First John, you can tell the writer will give you, whether it's John or Paul or Peter, or whatever, they'll give you indications by what they're telling the, the audience, what they're writing to, as to their status. Like Galatians, Paul was not happy with them. Uh, they were listening to the Judaizers, you know, getting circumcised. He was upset with them. Their status was not good. In fact, he doesn't even say, thank God. He doesn't even mention thanking God for them. That's how upset he was. He fired off this letter as fast as he could. It probably took him about a, 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 you know, a day or two to get it done, two days maybe. And, uh, and he was upset with them. So we know they weren't doing very well. And when you, so that helps you. Knowing that helps you. There's indication in the epistle if they're like First John 2, 12 to 14 and other passages in First John chapter 2. He says, affirms and commends them for their obedience to his gospel. So that means that tells us that they were not listening to the Judaizers or the, uh, the Gnostic teachers, the proto-Gnostic teachers, uh, the Antichrist or the false prophets of 1 John 4, 1 through 6. They weren't. They were being faithful to him. They were being in fellowship with God. And he wanted to protect them. So that helps you interpret the rest of the statements in the book. And know where they're at. That's very important. If you don't know these things, that's why you got before you start looking at each, each individual verse, uh, you know, you know, by yourself or you're a pastor or whatever, or you have a home Bible study you're running on, you're not a pastor or something. Read the whole book through a couple, several times before you start teaching it. Many times, because a lot of guys, I've even seen guys who are pastors for years. I've heard and they make mis- make blunders because they didn't read ahead. If they read it ahead, they wouldn't have made the interpretation that they had, which was off, earlier in the book. And then they get to the later in the book, and then they have to do what I call exegetical interpretive hand, uh, gymnastics to get around their mistake earlier in their book. And some who are humble will go back and say, hey, I made a mistake here. Let me go back here, because that's screwing up what I'm do- we're doing here. So hopefully they do that. So it's better to get it to, to, to say, hey, I, 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 made, I screwed up here. And to get it right than not to get it right. And just to, because you're pride, you don't want to admit you, have a, you screw up at all. So 1 John 2.14 says, I'm presently writing to each one of you children that each of you know the Father experientially. I'm, notice there. I'm presently writing to each one of you children that each of you know the Father experientially. So he's commending them, affirming that they were being faithful to his gospel. So uh, there we have it there. He's re- mentioning the, uh, the Father, knowing the Father experientially. He's doing that in 1 John 4, 7. This is the first time he mentions knowing the Father experientially in 1 John. Now, I have to re- reiterate this. If, you know, if they were knowing the Father experientially because they were obeying the command to love one another and all the other commands of Scripture, then they were knowing the, the Son experientially and the Spirit. Because if you have the fellowship with the Father, you're having fellowship with the other two members of the Trinity because they're God too. 
Okay. It's not like they're in different rooms, <laughs> you know, like they're all in the, we're all in the, they're all there with you and dwelling you. So John's overriding, it's interesting. John's overriding concern in this epistle, first John, is to ensure that the, the recipients of this letter who were believers continue to regularly experience fellowship with God, or in other words, that they personally encounter him through obedience to his apostolic teaching. He makes this clear in the prologue of first John and specifically in first John one, three, look at first John chapter one, verse one, the beginning of the book in my translation. I'll tell you, here's something. If you, if I was going to teach, uh, if I was, if you were going to talk, if you knew somebody was a new believer, new Christian, okay. What, the book I would tell them to read, I wouldn't tell them to go to Romans first. They're a new believer. I would tell them to go to 1 John, okay, because of the language. And also because it's basically talking a lot about this command to love one another, which is the royal family honor code, and that's the first thing the early first century church, including all the apostles, including John, they taught this command and all that involved, all that, what that meant to be, to, be, to love one another. So 1 John is a fantastic epistle. It's, it's, it's J. Vernon McGee, as I mentioned, used to say famously, uh, this is a family epistle. It talks about how the family of God is to function with each other. First John 1 John 1.1, we're now proclaiming to each of you what has always existed from eternity past, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we observe for ourselves, even what we touched with our hands concerning the word which is truly life. In other words, this life was revealed. He's, he's basically, the, what we see there, he's, he's referring, the what there is referring to the incarnate eternal life of God who is Jesus Christ. He uses the what rather than who because he's speaking of Jesus Christ as the incarnate eternal life of God. That's why he does that, as we pointed out. Now, this is important because the false teachers, the Gnostic teachers who taught what we call a ascetic form of Gnosticism, they denied that Jesus Christ was truly a human being. So John's saying, oh, yes, he was, and we're the eyewitnesses. And why is this important? This is very important because there's teaching around today, it hasn't gone away, that's a regurgitation of this, that's saying that Jesus wasn't really God, uh, a human being. Uh, he was a phantom, not to mention they don't think he's God, some of them. Now, that's important. God had to become a man. The son had to become a man. There would be no salvation if, the, if he didn't. Because salvation was because the son of God became a human being and died on the cross and rose from the dead. That couldn't happen if deity didn't enter into the human race. And the son did. So there'd be no salvation and therefore no fellowship and eternal relationship with the Trinity and no eternal life. So it's absolutely critical that you affirm not just the deity of Christ, of course, but his human nature. Because it was through his human nature that the eternal son of God provided for us our so great salvation through his death and resurrection. And then he says in the rest of verse 2, as noted previously, we have seen, so therefore we're now proclaiming by testifying to each of you this life, which is eternal, which because of its eternal nature has always existed face to face with the Father. Indeed, it was revealed to each one of us, us being the eyewitnesses to Jesus' hypostatic union. We saw him. We touched him. Don't tell me he wasn't a human being. I touched the man. I touched him. I saw him crucified. I saw him bleed. I saw him with a crown of thorns. I saw them when they nailed the spikes into his hand. I saw he was raised from the dead. I was there. I'm an eyewitness. And there are many of us. And at the time he wrote that, he was probably one of the last surviving uh, witnesses to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. So that's why the apostles, it, starting in the 60s, of the first century started putting these things down. They put everybody because they were going to they were going to be gone soon. So they wanted their testimony there down in writing, so for all generations to see. So here he's saying, "Don't listen to these these." And I know you're not, but but I'm to tell you. Don't ever listen to these Gnostic teachers because they don't know what they're talking about. I was there. It's like, that's why I say, you know, in, in, in anything that's going on in history, I always, when I study history, like outside of the Bible or even in when, uh, the history of the Bible, I want to listen, like for instance, let's say American history. I always don't listen to what the popular culture history out there. I don't, and I don't simply listen to some alternative history thing or revisionist history thing or all that. So I don't, no, what I listen, I want to listen to the people who are there. Let me talk to the, 
the police officers, or let me listen. Let me listen to the interviews of the police officers, or read their interviews. I want to. I want to. I want to. Or whoever it was, whatever event it was, whether it's assassination or or the World War Two or Hitler's Germany or whatever it was, Roosevelt, uh, Lincoln. Let me read. First person, I've read like, uh, like Civil War things, right? I read Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs. I've read Sherman's memoirs. I don't think I've read Lee's, I don't know. But I try to read all these guys, what they had to say, or people who were there. And, you know, so great thing with modern technology, you can listen to people uh, in their interviews. You can hear them. I, so what I'm saying is, I'd ra- I don't listen to, I don't, I'd rather not listen to, you know, I'd rather listen, things come from the horse's mouth, as we used to say. I want to, let me hear what they said. Oh, you saw, you were there for that event? What did you see? That's who the people I want, that's how I know what history was, what took place. I want to hear the accounts. And that's what the apostles try to do. The writers of scripture, the New Testament, they wanted you and I to know what they saw. That's why Christianity is the really, the only, hist- uh, it's the only, it is the only, it is the only religion on the face of the earth in history that is couched in history with real events, real people, eyewitness testimony. That's one of the re- I mean, I didn't know this when I got saved, obviously. Okay? But as I've grown and learned, I am so sure that my Bible is inspired by God. I am so sure that Jesus is risen from the dead, that he lives. Okay? I am... Got the total conviction of it. I know where I'm going when I die. I know what's going to happen after. I know my body. I have the conviction. I've, I believe the testimony of the Spirit through the writers of Scripture. Okay? So they want you to know, whoever you are, whether you're a believer, that, yeah, Jesus is both God and man. And that's important because we can't have fellowship if we don't make that affirmation. In fact, you don't, if you're a non-believer, you can never get saved. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man. And if you don't think he rose from the dead, then you don't believe he's God because the resurrection demonstrated he's God. And that we see it in 1 John 2. We see it in 1 John 4. Verse 6 verses. You don't believe that Jesus Christ is both God and man. Then you're not having fellowship with him as a believer. You're out of fellowship. You're, you're in apostasy. You need to confess the sin and do what it says. Affirm the, I uh, the, uh, agree with the apostolic testimony. Then he says in verse three, "What we have seen as well as heard, we are now proclaiming each of you, each of you, in order that each of you would also continue to regularly experience fellowship with each one of us. Also, our fellowship is in fact as an eternal spiritual truth, existing in the state of being with the Father as well as with His Son, who is Jesus, who is the Christ. So the Scriptures. We'll wrap it up with this. The Scriptures teach." That Christian, I'm going to go quickly here because we've done this subject. What I'm about to say we, is brief review because we did a whole series on Christian fellowship not too long ago uh, in between books. Was it on a weekday class? I think it was, yeah. Or it was a, su- a Sunday class. I think it was a Sunday class. I can't remember. The scripture, every day runs together. The scriptures teach that Christian fellowship, which is biblical, has two directions. Vertical, toward God. Horizontal, for those who don't know, body of Christ. Christian fellowship is a relationship and a partnership with God, as we pointed out in our study of fellowship. And Christ's body, and it's a, a Christian fellowship is a relationship and partnership with God and Christ's body, the church, and involves sharing his objective of, of advancing his kingdom on earth by caring for and working together with the body of Christ in this endeavor. The church age believer can experience fellowship with God because of the finished work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. Fellowship with God and one's fellow believer is based upon our union and identification with Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. And there are many synonyms in Scripture which describe the church age believer experiencing fellowship with God, one of them we've already mentioned earlier this evening. First of all, it's synonymous with experiencing eternal life. If you're experiencing fellowship with God, you're experiencing eternal life. Because experiencing fellowship with God is living an eternal life. You're experiencing eternal life. When a Christian is experiencing fellowship with God, they're experiencing eternal life. They're also experiencing their salvation. Or in other words, their deliverance from eternal condemnation. Condemnation from the law, spiritual and physical death, personal sin, enslavement from the sin nature of Satan and his cosmic system. So we studied salvation too. We had a big series on that between books as well, on salvation, which very, uh, it's very gratifying to see it 
the the classes, video and audio, are getting a lot of hits. And the, the written document, the PDF is doing too. That's really good because we need to hear this. A lot of people don't know what salvation means, amazingly. Uh, forgiveness for my sins. There's much more than that as we studied. Also, to experience fellowship with God is also to experience one sanctification. Or in other words, fellowship with God is experiencing being set apart to serve God exclusively and doing his will. And we've also seen in the past that if we're going to have fellowship with God, we must be filled with the Spirit. And that means, uh, ac- uh, what it actually means is being uh, influenced by the Holy Spirit, and he influences us through the Scriptures. And when we obey what he's teaches in, teaching us in the Scriptures, we're being filled with the Spirit. The word filled there in Ephesians 5.18, which we studied as well in between books, the filling of the Spirit. All these subjects we've done means to be influenced by the Holy Spirit, not filled like, a, like this, ju- this jug, okay, or this, what is this called? Whatever it's called. It's not like you're filling up with water. It has a figurative meaning there, okay? So we must, if we're going to have fellowship with God, we must be filled with the Spirit, and you do that by obeying the Spirit as he speaks to us through the Scriptures. You also, to experience fellowship with God, and this is what John's driving at in 1 John, we must be operating in the love of God, in order to experience fellowship with God. And when a believer is experiencing fellowship with God, they will experience undeserved suffering, which advances them to spiritual maturity. We studied at 2 Timothy, in that book we studied, 2 Timothy 3.12, those who desire to live godly will be persecuted. Okay? So there'll be times that we'll be persecuted by people, and obviously the kingdom of darkness, when we're living in fellowship with God. Not all the time, but many times it can happen. Now the believer... Well, if you're having fellowship with God, and you're, you're, you're going to pray for your fellow believer, not get bitter towards your fellow believer. You know you're in fellowship with God when you're practicing the love command, and instead of going, you know, like Paul says in Colossians 3, was it 12, anyone has a complaint against anyone, forgive them. And you know what I do? I remember that, and I go, start praying for the person. In fact, there was a person last night, I, you know, I was kind of upset with, like 3.30 in the morning, I woke up, which is not unusual, and I prayed for them. Instead of getting mad at them or upset with them, I prayed for the person. It's like, that's staying in fellowship with God. Now, if I was bitter about them and started sit, you know, sitting there going, and stomping around the house and throwing things and, you know, and being mad and having a temper tantrum, a little fit, okay, like when I was a little boy, that's not in fellowship with God. Fellowship with God means I'm praying for that person. I'm not going to pl- complain about them. I'm going to love them up. <laughs> I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to tr- forgive them and do what God says. That's, that's obeying the command to love one another by doing those two things I just mentioned. And that's when you're having fellowship with God. If I'm not doing those two things, I'm not having fellowship with God. I'm lying to myself if I, and lying to God if I say I am when I'm bitter toward the person. So lastly... And we close with this and go to our prayer meeting. Lastly, the believer who experienced fellowship with God and grows to spiritual maturity will experience intimacy with God. The word friend, like in the, John's up, uh, the upper room discourse, uh, John 15, you are my friends if you do what I say, Jesus said. John 4, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, he mentions the word friend, especially in 15, and that's an expression of intimacy. Uh, uh, somebody who's really close is somebody who's a friend. A friend is, you know, there's acquaintances, you've heard me say, and then there's friends. Friends are people you can share stuff with and you can trust them. Acquaintances, you're not going to share everything with these people. Not Because you, you, can't, you can't be on intimate terms with everybody. Like for instance, let me give an example, a better example. A husband and wife, there are going to be things between a husband and wife that only they know. It's between them and nobody else. And that's why a lot hurt a lot of marriages and even Christian marriages, when, you know, uh, the intimacy is broken with one or both partners, you know, you know, sp- spilling their guts about the other to somebody else, which you should never do. There's a certain intimacy between marriage that nobody should have touch. That's just between you two. And there's a certain inti- certain thing I have with the Lord, and you have your thing with the Lord, and there, then we're friends. If we're in intimate terms with the Lord, he can call us friends. In fact, it says that in James too. Abraham was called a friend of God. Because he did. Why? Because he was obedient to God. And because he was obedient to God, he was having fellowship with God. And that's what God wants from all of us. He wants us to be all on intimate terms with him. But only those who are obedient to him are going to be. And those who are the more, 
more uh, obedient, we'll be the closer to him. We're as close, as to, close to the Lord as we want to be. Remember James, remember in the old Gospels, you always found, you had, you had all these disciples of Jesus, what, about 150, and then you had the 12 apostles, but you always saw the Lord grabbing James, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. You know why? Because they were the closest to him. John was very close to him. It's the closest because he stuck with him at the cross and, and, had his, and Jesus gave his mother to take care of him, for, her, for him to take care of. Now, that's pretty intimate. Okay, I'm, it'd be like, if I'm about to die and I have no brothers or sisters, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm taking care of, well, no, this is, I have brothers and sisters, and I say to my friend, you know, I'm dying, I think, Titus, take care of my mother. And he tells me, get out, get out of here. Take care of my mother. That's, that's something I'm saying, you're my friend, I trust you. You're, I, I'm, give, I'm trusting you with my mother. That's pretty close. That's what I'm saying. You're as close as you want to be. John took the chance at staying at the cross. I'm sure the other guys regretted it. They all did, I'm sure. And Peter was upset about what he did. He denied the Lord three times. John was right there. John had an advantage, though. He was a young boy. He knew the high priest. They weren't going to touch him. But he didn't know that for sure. But he stuck there with the women. All the women stayed there. And, uh, you know, Mary Magdalene and his mother and everything. But you're as close to the Lord you want to be. Paul, who never was a dis- walked with the Lord. I mean, he was an adversary of the Lord, really. Uh, but he, when he got saved, Paul said, you know, Paul was single. All the other guys were married. I mean, he might, more than likely, he was married as a Pharisee. I think all, the, pretty much sure, all the Pharisees, they all were married. And they were pretty wealthy, too. And, but I think he, that marriage blew up when he, when he became a believer. And, uh, but he never mentions it, so we don't really don't know. You're only speculating. But he was close. And he got really close to the Lord because of the things he suffered. That's when you really get to know the Lord, is when you're going through suffering. Not stuff that you, well, you can get to learn, know the Lord when you've done stupid things. You get to know the Lord's grace and mercy and love that he forgives you when you've done stupid things. But when we go through undeserved suffering, stuff that we didn't bring on ourselves, that's when we get really close to the Lord. The fellowship of his sufferings, Paul calls it, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. How close do you want to be? Are you willing to go through trials and tribulations for the sake of the Lord, so you can get closer to him and, just, and, and experience the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. That's what Paul, that was his one ambition. I mean, how many Christians do you do at a survey today would say that's what their ambition in life is? <clears throat> you find very few. And it's, it's, that's pretty heavy stuff, but Paul was the closest to the Lord because of what he suffered. You know, so we'll, uh, we'll continue this study. Um, remember, we don't have class next, the classes next week are canceled, but we are having class this Sunday, obviously, and we're going to continue our study of the rapture, the resurrection of the church. We're going to be noting what the resurrection body is all about. We're going to actually talk about the resurrection body. We know that the rapture is, when that happens, is when the church age believer gets their resurrection body, so we're going to talk about this Sunday's class about the resurrection body. It'll be exciting. So let's close in prayer and then we'll have our prayer meeting. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us and help us understand what's being taught. Help us to make application. And we thank you for everyone that was here this evening. And we pray, Father, that this lesson would be a great blessing to you people. And we thank you for all those in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing or listening to this class live or to later date at the recordings on the website. So Father, we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen.